Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Hello and thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather. I'm meteorologist Kim Kimberly Hepner and today is Wednesday, September 30th, 2015. And boy, has it been a busy two days of weather. When you have 48 hours of weather across the state in a couple of areas, normally, you know, we don't think anything of it. You know, we move on. But when the weather affects the entire state the way it has the last um, two days, we really feel it all over the state with travel, friends, and just reaching out to everyone to make sh sure it's okay. So in just a moment, we will also have your outlook for the next two days, because I'm sure everyone wants to know after an impacting storm system that we had on what's coming in the next two days. And that's what we're gonna have for you in just a moment. So if you are off, um, if we're off air, you can always get our information at www.arh.noaa.gov. And then just click around to the areas that you like, or you can call us on our weather information line at 1-800-472-0391. And as always, we have a social media page where you can find our Facebook and Twitter notes. Also, um, the hot topics of the day, we always like to start with that. So moving on to the headlines, I'm gonna step off your screen so you can read them with me a moment. And what we're gonna be looking at for the next 24 hours to come up is the high surf conditions along the West Coast. And in just a moment, we'll move on to our warnings and advisory map for that. And we'll also be looking at the winds across the Eastern Bering and West Coast, the focus being Thursday. We'll have gusty offshore flow across the northern coastal areas and rain and snow across the west and moving into the south at the latter part of the week. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, this area that's highlighted in yellow is for the coastal areas for the high surf and we're expecting that to come up tomorrow with the storm system that's moving across the bearing. So be on the lookout for high surf conditions across the Kuskokwim Delta and also, we're going to be looking across the Seward Peninsula and St. Lawrence Island. We're going to have high surf conditions from Thursday into Friday for these areas. Also, they have a high wind warning that's going to be out until um, Thursday late evening. And then stay tuned for updates as the winds are going to be gusting there between 40 and 50 miles per hour with higher gusts up to 60 miles per hour. So let's take a look at what's bringing our weather the next several days. You'll see there's a comma cloud right here across the western area of the bearing back towards Kamchatka in Russia there, putting this into motion. You can see this plume of moisture is pushing into the central areas of the bearing. A little bit of a break ahead of this system across the eastern areas of the bearing from Dutch Harbor and across the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, putting this into motion one more time, like I said, there's a cyclonic rotation just along this low pressure that's setting to the west of Shimia. Lo looking closer to home, we wanna focus here on the southeast. We have a front that was situated across the area earlier today that was pushing inland with a little bit of a break behind the system. Low pressure is spinning across the northern Gulf and just general cloudiness and showers across the northern tier of the state, finishing off here with the visible satellite data. It gives you a little bit better view of the showery pattern that wound up this afternoon with um, more of the stratiform rain towards the Dixon entrance and inland towards Canada. Uh, across much of the state, we had some clearing out, especially across south central areas and the southwest with some general clouds across the interior, snow across the east and the northeastern areas, taking a look towards the north. We do have some snow and showery conditions continuing along the coast. As you see, there's just a little weak upper level disturbance that's moving in from the Bering Strait area. 
Now looking at your weather today, here's the surface low pressure system situated just south of Cordova uh, and Yakutat at 1,000 millibar. Um, 1,008 millibars, this system is weakening. Some clearing across the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, so certainly getting a nice little break. Uh, we saw some snow across the south central areas up to six to 10 inches in the higher elevations between two and four across the lower elevations valleys. Um, even Homer in the higher elevations saw between six to eight inches of snow. Across the uh, Palmer Wasilla area, they saw between one to two inches, and then across the rest of uh, the south central areas, mainly between one to two inches with higher amounts. But we really saw rain along Cordova over to uh, Yakutat between three to five inches for storm totals. And then the southeastern areas, they had seen totals between four to five inches on average across the southeast. So uh, now that they're um, going to be pushing into the showery pattern this afternoon, that'll give them a little break. And then we also had snow from Fairbanks and north averages between five to eight inches with um, additional amounts up to 15 inches in those higher elevations all the way up to the North Pole uh, and then across the coastal areas between, you know, uh, very light snow totals up there between one to three inches of snow. However, they are getting um, the gusty or wind conditions across the northwest coast. Now, um, the next system that's moving into our area is out here in the western barrier. It's an occluded front wrapping up just towards the Kamchatka Peninsula with the strong winds across the central Aleutians earlier today. Some rain with this system uh, as it has a warm plume of moisture just ahead of the system with slightly cooler air mass on the tail end. However, not as cold as the temperatures that we saw move in last night. We have a ridge just south of the eastern Aleutians and this is uh, keeping conditions in between the two systems a little bit clearer than what we've seen for the last two days. So a break with some showery conditions across uh, the the mountains in the Kuskokwim region and then we see some showers popping up this afternoon upper level disturbance over the Alaska Peninsula. Now looking at your forecast for tonight this front across the bearing is going to be advancing into the central areas of the bearing possibly bring some patchy fog and light rain towards the Pribilof Islands and then across much of the state we're going to stay dry so maybe cooler temperatures back down to freezing again for much of the south and interior locations much colder to the north of course and then the surface low will be pushing off bringing some shower activity uh, through the late evening hours and then drying out behind changing over to snow as you head further inland and north and then a showery pattern staying across the Brooks Range as that upper level disturbance kind of scoots over on towards the east with uh, just mainly showery conditions expected. Um, no major accumulations with that system. And then as we head into your Thursday, we'll see these showers taper off by the morning as this ridging sets up across the central areas of the state. Very strong ridge at 1037 at the surface. So what we're going to see happen here tomorrow, a little bit of a gradient and offshore flow is going to set up across the, the southern areas of the Gulf, um, I'm sorry, the Gulf Coastal areas here. So look for winds uh, during the overnight hours to possibly pick up, but more likely when we start warming up between 10 and 1 tomorrow, offshore flow picking up across the Valdez area. So look for gusty conditions, 10 to 20 mile per hour sustained with possible gusts up to 35, maybe in 40, depends on how much uh, winds mix down to the surface here. Now across the northern tier of the state, they're gonna hang on to the gusty winds across the coast with some snow showers continuing. And then the major part of the system is gonna be hitting the eastern areas of the Bering and the west coast. Here the winds are going to be gusting between 40 and 50 miles per hour with gusts up to 60 miles per hour. And this is gonna be stretching from the eastern Aleutians all the way up to the Bering Strait. Be on the lookout for uh, snow conditions initially and then changing over to rain late in the day as this warmer air, pa air mass pushes inland. Then we have a cooler front just extending from the southern part of this system. Looking at Friday, uh, this system moves north, keeping a generally gusty flow, but not as strong as we see on Friday. 
Um, on Friday, we also have rain across the southwest, south central areas starting as snow changing over to rain late in the day. And then we also have a mix of rain and snow across much of the interior. However, um, Fairbanks and east and north will see mainly uh, snow conditions with this system and snow along the north and northwest with all gusty conditions as this front moves in. So prolonged gusty conditions there, gusty winds across the southeast, uh, mainly out of the north, south tomorrow early, and then changing out of the north and high pressure prevailing through the end of the week there. We saw the warmest temperatures across um, the southeast today with temperatures reaching up into the mid 50s and then across the coastal areas, mainly in the upper 40s. As you went up um, towards Fairbanks area, closer to freezing with the changeover temp temperatures up in the Brooks Range and North, North Pole area, all in the mid 20s with the coldest temperature there at Anatovic Pass at 21 degrees this afternoon. Seward Peninsula uh, climbing back up here to the lower 40s as you head into the southwest. Southwest was all in the mid to upper 40s and across the Bering and the Aleutians, the Alaska Peninsula, fairly warm conditions out there, mainly near 50 degrees. And then for your temperatures overnight, not much change out there, mainly in the upper 40s. Coldest as you go inland with temperatures reaching down um, into the lower 20s and teens across the central interior and possibly in the mid 20s uh, along the Kenai Peninsula South Central. So look for colder temperatures there along the Brooks Range in the teens and 20s just along the slope and northwest coast a little bit warmer in the southeast also in the lower 40s. And then for your highs tomorrow with some clearing, we'll see temperatures rising back up into the mid to upper 40s across much of the western coastal areas into the 50s across the southeast into the um, 30 degree range, mainly across much of the interior with uh, Brooks Range seeing in the lower 20s increasing into the uh, uh, mid 30s across the north and northwest coast. Warmer along the west in the 40s to mid 50s with this warm front pushing in. We'll see widespread temperatures in the 50s across the bearing. Looking at your flying weather tomorrow, the biggest concern is going to be across much of the bearing and also in the morning if there's some patchy fog that may develop it might be IFR to MVFR across mainly across the er areas of south central the mountains and area waters as we have that ridging set up so look for a possible patchy fog and then improving during the late day and also along the northern coast where they have that low pressure system IFR to MVFR there. The passes in more depth we should see VFR conditions for Anatovic and both Adigan Pass for tomorrow and then we have Lake Clark and Merrill starting off as MVFR and then changing to VFR during the day and same for Rainy MVFR to VFR and we'll see Windy Pass MVFR to VFR, Isabel MVFR to VFR and Mintasta MVFR to VFR. Tanita Pass will be MVFR to VFR and Portage will also be MVFR to VFR. And Chilkoot and White Pass once again from MVFR to VFR later in the day. Now looking at your freezing levels, all across the West Coast, we see the surface freezing level draped across the Gulf Coast back towards the Southeast and then an increase of the 2000 foot level along the Bering, I'm sorry, the Bering Strait um, to the 12,000 foot level across the Aleutian chain with that warm front and 2,000 foot across the northern Gulf increasing to 6,000 feet just below the Gulf here. And looking at your icing tomorrow, concerns are going to be mainly across the north coast below 2,000 feet and then widespread conditions across the Bering with the front coming there between eight to between four to 8,000 feet across the central bearing and above 7,000 feet when you get down towards the Aleutians. Looking at your upper level jet stream, 130 to 140 knot um, amplified jet here across the western areas of the Aleutians with the amplification of the ridge across much of the state. And then we have another low that's digging well to the south. And then uh, at the 9,000 foot level, we have low pressure parked in the northern Gulf here with the strongest winds here out of the southwest between 60, um, 50 to 60 miles per hour across the eastern bearing. Change of wind direction around as we get the offshore flow component across the Gulf waters out of the north between 20 to 35 knots. And then a westerly flow across much of the state at between 
25 to 35 knots. Looking at your 3,000 foot level, very similar pattern as this system out here in the Bering is stacked. And we'll see the gustiest winds once again across the eastern Bering between 45 and 70 knots down there just across the eastern areas of the Bering. Offshore flow between 15 to 25 knots with higher gusts. And then we'll see tomorrow's turbulence focused mainly across the Bering with uh, the widespread occasional um, moderate conditions across the eastern bearing below 7,000 feet and then we'll be looking at below 4,000 feet for the offshore flow and the change of wind direction across the southeast and then we have the stronger flow across the eastern boat for seacoast down to the eastern brooks range below 1,000 foot uh, 4,000 feet there and below 7,000 feet across the western part of the Aleutians. In just a moment we'll be back with your marine forecast. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And joining us once again is our good friend Eric Stevens from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska. Uh, he is here and has been here many times to talk to us about weather satellites and how those can help Alaskans understand our weather, how we can do better detection, keep more people safe from things even like volcanic ash. But today, Eric, you're going to talk to us a little bit more about weather satellites and how that can keep Alaskans safe and protect our property from wildfire, right? That's right, Dave. Uh, today's topic is uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh -huh. And uh, thanks for having us back again to Alaska Anytime. Weather. Well, um, weather satellites have a lot of different instruments on them. Uh -huh. It turns out that the electromagnetic spectrum has a lot going on in it, and only one part of that is visible light, what we see. Right. Weather satellites, of course, report that. Today's topic is wildfires. Okay. There are some people who say that in Alaska in the summertime, you don't have severe weather. These people are usually from Oklahoma <laughs> or somewhere. And, and F5 tornadoes tend not to occur in Alaska. Right. People have also said what we do have in the summer. What is Alaska's severe summer weather can be hydrology, right. flash flood and, and uh, erosion mm -hmm. in the mountains and things like that, and fires, right. wildfires. Absolutely. Those were here in 2004, certainly remember that. I've got an example here from 2014, mm -hmm. now it was a quiet season overall, but in May, down on the Kenai Peninsula, we had a uh, wildfire on the Funny River, mm -hmm. and this is a satellite image from a satellite, a polar orbiter that went right over Alaska, mm -hmm. and we can see the plume of smoke coming out of that fire on the Kenai, curling down, it's caught in the wind, right. it goes down toward Kodiak Island, curves around, you can see it circulating around a low pressure system that's in the Gulf yeah, of Alaska. It was a beautiful picture. Oh my gosh. Except there was a fire. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fire there. The nice thing is with this satellite image, you can tell where, this, where the fire origin is, where right. the smoke is coming from. And um, it's a color image. We're looking at the wavelength spectrum of about 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers or microns. Mm -hmm. That's what the human eye would see. If you were riding on the satellite and looked down, you could see this kind of an image. Right. So that's pretty nice. But it turns out there's more to the electromagnetic spectrum than just visible light. Okay. You've heard of infrared ultraviolet, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. If we move into longer wavelengths, let's go to one specifically, 3.7 micron. Okay, 3.7. Why worry about that one? Okay. Well, we've got an example here. 3.7, it turns out, happens to be very sensitive to a certain temperature range, temperatures where fires burn. Okay. And so we've got an example zoomed in a little more from that same Funny River fire mm -hmm. down on the Kenai Peninsula, and we can see that you get up into a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit, right. and that's where the colors are. We can see there, um, on the Funny River Fire to the west and to the east, almost a horseshoe shape there, mm -hmm. is not only we're seeing where the fire is in a general sense, but specifically where it's the active so fire That is where front. it's burning right now. Mm -hmm. And Amazing. it's 3.7 okay. microns is the important temperature there. Okay. That's right. So it, this is really important to firefighters on the ground, people that are making plans and directing the firefighters and where they need to go and cut the trenches and keep people safe. You know it. Wow. If you want to fight that fire, you got to know where it is. Okay. You got to know the leading edge. We've also got a movie loop, nothing mm -hmm. quite like animating it in time. Yeah. You can see the fire spreading out over time with a succession of films cool. or a succession of uh, images. Mm -hmm. Now this is one channel, 3.7 micron. You know, we looked at that color smoke image before. Right. And that's actually a red, a green, and a blue. That's how you get color imagery. Uh -huh. What if you took three different wavelengths in the infrared? You went from like 2.2 um, micron, 1.5 micron, up to 3.7. You mix them together, you get this other kind of color image, which is even a better way to oh, wow. sharply bring out the details of where that leading edge of the fire is. Okay. You'll note, though, in the infrared, 
guess what? We don't see the smoke. Uh, That's too bad. And on these movie loops, you can see the clouds go by. These channels can't see through clouds. The lesson is there's no one perfect solution. You've got to okay. have the visible, got to have some of that infrared single 3.7 channel, some of the infrared mixing mm -hmm. to help get a different perspective. Another one, we've talked before about a, a fun channel called the Day Night Band. Yes, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. And in Alaska in the winter, it's great. We've got all this darkness. The Day Night Band is so sensitive to seeing light, uh -huh. um, you can see features that otherwise aren't available. Now, in Alaska, when you have a forest fire, it tends to be light out all the time. Right. It's our summer. But we can go down south to the Rim Fire in California in okay. 2013. Now, okay, it was in California, not Alaska, but Alaskan crews went down to fight that fire, so we Fair can enough. talk about it here in Alaska weather. Here we have... Uh, a 3.7 micron channel shot of the of the rim fire again kind of a horseshoe shape showing right. that active fire front down there and then we'll look again to the day night band the visible light and then you can see how the fire is all bright you can see the active fire front and actually the the city lights over there too turns yes. out that the cities while they're active in a social sense are not really hot in a fire sense so um, they don't show up in the 3.7 micron. They're not hot like a fire is, but the fire in the cities look the same from a visible light perspective. And a fun thing here, too, is that we can see the smoke plume going north from the rim fire wow. on the, uh, the day-night band. So yeah. if we were ever to have, like in 2004 in Alaska, you get mm -hmm. dark at night, we still had an active fire season that year. Right, that was right. a, you know, that really bad year. The day-night band didn't exist then, but it, if we had fires now in August, we could use it then. The lesson here is weather satellites, they offer many different wavelengths of light. Uh -huh. Some are used for different purposes, and some of these we just looked at tonight are especially helpful here in Alaska to find and to track the behavior of these wildfires so the crews can go out there and do their jobs. Sure, sure. So a satellite toolbox for the, the firefighting crews and the fire weather forecasters, and it just underlines how important satellites are, uh, especially for Alaska and our, our mission for the National Weather Service to uh, protect life and property and uh, also to enhance the national economy. So wonderful mm -hmm. stuff there, Eric. And people can look at pictures uh, like this anytime by going to gina.alaska.edu. Uh, you'll find images there all around Alaska at various times of the year and not just about fire weather, but uh, volcanic ash and smoke and uh, anything else you want to check out. They're always beautiful pictures and always interesting to look at no matter what time of the day. Thanks again for joining us, Eric. We appreciate it and welcome you back anytime uh, for this edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. Matter. See you next time. Welcome back to the show and now taking a look at today's sea ice edge. Not much changes to note other than we will be continuing to see that ice edge grow. Now, um, if you're looking for the highest wind conditions across the next two days, uh, I think your focus is going to be mainly on Thursday. Uh, for the southeast, we're, we're going to see a southerly flow across the southern channels, um, changing out of the north later in the day, mainly a north, it becomes north wind across the area at 20 knots. A uh, northwesterly flow across the outer waters around 15 knots, becoming more northeasterly up towards Yakutat around 20 knots. Inner channels will be around 4 foot for the seas tomorrow and between 9 to 11 foot seas across the outer waters. On Friday, you'll see stronger winds actually for the southeast. We'll see a northerly flow across the area, small crafts across the inner channels and then we'll see a northerly flow to northwesterly flow with seas around five to six feet across the outer waters. We'll see primarily 15 to 20 knots with the stronger winds to the south. Seas that day will be between four to six feet across the outer waters. And then we'll see on Thursday, the stronger winds mainly will be confined to the northern Gulf, all out of the northwest direction except variable flow across the northern Cook Inlet. And then we'll see three foot seas across the Prince William Sound, two foot mainly across the Cook Inlet, across the western and northern Gulf locations, seven to nine foot seas, and then across the Barren Islands, seven feet, and Shelikoff Strait will be around um, three feet for your Thursday. Friday, uh, we'll see a southerly flow, uh, picking up all small craft across the Shelikoff Strait, uh, around Kodiak Island, Barren Islands, and the southern Cook Inlet. Uh, the flow will change out of the east across the Prince William Sound and then more of a southeasterly flow across the northern inlet there. Seas between two to four feet across the inlet locations and Shelikoff Strait 
all other areas will see seas between 7 to 10 feet. And then across the Alaska Peninsula tomorrow, strong winds between 35 to 45 knots, higher gusts up to 50 knots across the northern peninsula areas. Seas of actually 10 to 12 feet across the Bristol Bay out towards the northern peninsula. Pacific side will be seeing seas between 6 to 13 feet. On your Friday, winds will come down small craft out of the south around 25 knots higher gust to the north and nine foot seas on the bearing side, seven to 12 on the Pacific side. The bearing, uh, the southern bearing will see um, between 30 knots to 40 knots as you head towards the east, very strong winds between 45 to 50 knots with the seas between 17 to 18 feet, higher seas on the Pacific side up to 23 feet and then out towards the west small crafts there uh, between 15 to 16 feet. All winds are going to be out of the south and southwest changing direction more southwesterly on Friday coming down to all small craft 25 to 30 knot across the area and seas would be between 9 and 14 feet high as seas out towards the west. And then looking at your west coastal areas, the strong winds affecting here of 40 to 50 knots across the entire area with seas ranging between 16 to 23 feet with the highest seas as you go towards the northern areas of the Bering. And then Friday coming down, stronger winds to the north, still 40 knots, gales there. And then small craft for much of the area out of the south and southwesterly direction seas will be between 10 and 14 feet that day and then your arctic coastal waters Kotzebue sound will all um, be pretty much under small craft criteria around along Kotzebue between uh, 20 knots increasing to 25 to 35 knots gales across, across the eastern boat for sea coast freezing spray out there look for seas between five to six feet eight feet across the northern coastal areas looking at friday change of wind direction between 15 to 20 knots strongest winds down near Kotzebue, gales there. Uh, seas will be between 10 and 11 feet and then wrapping around to the north between five to seven feet. Recapping your forecast for tonight, look for showery conditions mainly during the overnight hours, wettest um, there along the northeastern Gulf front moving into the Barren with the strongest winds between 40 and 50 knots, gusting by tomorrow up to 60 knots along the northern areas of the Bering front pushing inland, rain and snow, drier across south central and the southeast we'll see some showers tapering off, gusty winds across the north there. And then as we head into your Friday, showery pattern overspreads much of the state, wettest across south central, changeover from rain to snow and lighter precip in the Bering. Glad to have you with us tonight. See you back again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.